Before we get into the series of videos on how I use my table saw, I think it's important to cover a few of the basics. First is that I have a lot of experience using a table saw. I've been using it for more than 30 years and I have learned a lot along the way. So some of what you're going to hear are some of the things that I learned along the way. However, there's no way that I can teach you the experience that I have. You have to learn on your own. You have to actually use a tool to gain experience to become more safe while you're using it. And speaking of safety, that's not the main thrust of this series of videos. Instead, it's more of a guide on how I use my table saw here in my workshop. My table saw is homemade and I've had it pointed out several times by several people in several videos over several years that it doesn't have a riving knife and it doesn't have a blade guard. What a riving knife does is it helps to prevent kickback under certain circumstances, say if the stock is starting to close together at the back and pinching on the blade, that can cause kickback and the riving knife will stop that from happening. It's a good feature and I highly recommend it. However, it can be somewhat limiting for the size and thickness of the blade that you use. If you're going to use a thinner curved blade, you have to take it off entirely or find a riving knife that matches the thickness. Same thing goes for the diameter. It really shouldn't be above the top of the blade. The reason why there's not one on this saw is that I, first of all, didn't make the saw to accept one. And all of the saws that I learned on and, and owned over the years, none of them were manufactured or came equipped with a riving knife. So it was not an option. I had to learn methods to prevent kickback that didn't rely on the riving knife. Now as for a blade guard, I found that they get in the way too much. They obstruct my view of the cut. They also get in the way when you're pushing sock through. There are operations where one is, you know, more viable than others, especially if you're doing a lot of repetitive rip cuts where it's not going to get in the way. But for general operations, I'm not going to have a blade guard on my saw. And that's a decision that I've made for myself based on my level of experience and also my acceptance of the risks involved. I need to say this clearly again, because people sometimes don't listen to what you're actually saying. I'm not telling people to remove the riving knife on their saw. I'm not recommending that. If you have a riving knife on your saw, I recommend that you keep it there and use it. If you have a blade guard on your saw, same thing. If you're comfortable or more comfortable using it with the blade guard, by all means do that. Everything that you see in my videos is what I do here in my shop. Whatever you do at home in your shop is your responsibility. You're going to hear me say that word often throughout this series, and that's because, in my opinion, there's nothing else more important, especially where the table saw is concerned, than maintaining control over the workpiece as you push it through. It's the best uh, strategy for avoiding injury, in my opinion. Now, in this first one, I want to talk about where I stand when I'm making a cut because you're gonna hear a lot of people giving advice that you shouldn't stand right behind the blade or you shouldn't stand in the line of fire as it's called. And that's good advice, but if it compromises your control over the workpiece, that's where the advice falls down. I position myself more or less kind of sideways, maybe at an angle a little bit like this. If I'm feeding stock, long narrow stock like this through, and then I'm out of the line of fire, so that's good, right? But I also have good control over the workpiece. My hand over here pushes it up against the fence. My hand back here feeds it through. That's because I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, the best strategy, of course, is to move your fence on the other side of the blade and do an exact opposite of that. In this first example, I'm using that angled stance like I talked about before. And as you can see, I'm not positioned awkwardly. I have full control over the workpiece as I'm pushing it through the saw. For this next cut on wider stock that happens to be shorter, I'm standing more straight to the saw and I am actually in the line of fire. However, I've positioned myself this way 
to give myself the best control possible over the workpiece as I'm feeding it through the saw. The key takeaway from that is that there are no hard and fast rules, especially if you have to violate something more important to do it, like giving up control over the workpiece to position yourself in an awkward location. Often when people watch somebody that's using this table saw that has a lot of experience will get the impression that they're being complacent or sloppy or careless. And I've often said that it's not the things that you see me do while I'm using a table saw. It's the things that you don't see me do. And probably chief among them is never to let go of the stock while it's going through the saw. This goes back to the control thing again. You never want to let go of the work as it's passing through the saw. One of the bad things that can happen, probably the most inconsequential one, is you can ruin the cut that you're trying to make. I mean, if you're trying to get a smooth, clean cut, a continuous, steady feed is the best approach. And certainly, you don't want to be uh, letting go of the stock and letting it bounce against the side of the blade. Also, you've increased the chance of kickback by a very wide margin. Whenever you leave a piece floating between the fence and the blade, kickback can happen. Now, of course, this is foam. It's lighter and it's a bit more grabby on the blade, but it does illustrate what can happen if you leave a piece floating between the fence and the blade. The blade can grab it and kick it back. And even if you're not standing in a line of fire, it can still get you because you can't predict exactly where it's going to go.